We're very excited to have Professor Barry Lovegrove with us today. He is an emeritus professor from the University of KwaZulu-Natal. He is an evolutionary physiologist specializing in the diversity of metabolic adaptations in birds and animals. He obtained his PhD from the University of Cape Town in 1987 and undertook postdoctoral studies at universities in uh, America and in Germany. And he is a National Research Foundation A-rated scientist. Thank you for being with us, Barry, and uh, over to you now. Thank you. Hello, everybody. From a not so warm Peter Maritzburg, it's been raining for days, it's cold and miserable. Um, when I first wrote uh, uh, The Living Deserts 28 years ago, uh, we had a certain knowledge of how the deserts operated, but it's just quite remarkable how much has changed in the 28 years since then. And so what I'd like to do in this presentation is just introduce you to the various chapters in the book and tell you what they are about. And then also give you examples of some of the new research that is added to our understanding of these uh, remarkable desert biomes that we have in Southern Africa. Here are the chapters. Um, I'm just going to move this my screen out the way so that I can see what I'm doing. Now, the, in the original book, there were 10 chapters. Uh, uh, sorry, there were nine chapters, but in the new edition, there's a new chapter, and that is chapter nine, called The Ancient Karoo. Otherwise, the chapter names have remained the same, and I'll tell you about The Ancient Karoo shortly. All right, so these, uh, these are the chapters, and... Uh, let me just go through them and show you what's happened. Chapter one, which is called the deserts, it introduces the desert biomes. The major change that has taken place in that chapter is the updating of the biomes map, updated according to the 2018 map produced by the South African National Botanical Institute. Then from chapters two to, to eight, the only uh, updating that has taken place there is the inclusion of new research on those mostly mechanistic topics that uh, describe how uh, plants and animals survive in the desert. Chapter nine is a completely brand new chapter. It's called uh, The Ancient Karoo, and it's about the origin of the Permian and the Triassic sauropsids and synapsids in the Karoo Basin, this incredible wealth of fossils that we have in the Karoo. And then in chapter 10, the is, has been completely revised. I don't think there's a single word that I kept from the, uh, from the original book. And this is because of our new understanding uh, of uh, climate change effects and threats to the desert biomes. And, to and it also introduces a lot of new conservation initiatives that have taken place in the last 28 years. Now, this is chapter one, the deserts, and it introduces the four desert biomes. And this is the new biome map. So this is the desert biome here in yellow. This is the succulent Karoo. This is the Nama Karoo. And this is the arid savanna. And this, the, the, certainly the data for South Africa are very, very recent. The data for Namibia are still slightly uncertain, particularly the eastern boundary here of the arid savanna. I have seen those data, they were given to me, but then withheld from me, so I wasn't allowed to publish them. But I can tell you that it looks very similar to this. It's a squealy line along here and it more or less follows the 500 millimeter isohyate. So that was the desert biome. The next biome, of course, is the succulent Karoo. What you see here is a picture of annuals, which uh, most people uh, know Namacroland by its annuals. But in fact, uh, Namacroland's real floral wealth and biodiversity lies in the enormous family uh, Azoaceae, the, the succulent plants which occur there. Then there's the arid savanna, which we generally know as the Kalahari, or some people call it the Kalahari. 
and it is characterized certainly in vast past of its uh, of the region by these linear vegetated sand dunes so characteristic of certainly of the uh, of the southern Kalahari and so descriptions of these biomes are included in in chapter 1 and then of course the uh, the Namakaru itself the interior desert here you see a photograph of a typical copy. In fact, this one is famous. It's called Tiebus. And uh, I researched the name and found out that it's actually named after the containers, the, the, the tin containers in which uh, tea and coffee used to, used to be sold in, uh, in, in the centuries past. And that little top there is the cap of the tin. So this is the Namakaru. And then, of course, um, uh, yeah, that's number three. Now, in chapter two, chapter two deals with the currency of, of, of life in the deserts, which is water. And essentially, it, it looks at how animals face problems of losing water and how they face problems of gaining water and how these two need to be balanced against each other. And uh, let me give you an example of some of the new research that uh, I have included in this chapter. If you have a look at this photograph, this is me standing next to a Dolvitia in, the, um, in, in Namibia. And uh, the, the great enigma, one of the great enigmas about this plant is its broad leaves. Generally, desert plants do not have broad leaves because this offers a very large surface area over which they can lose water. And yet, this is a remarkable survivor of these uh, very arid uh, landscapes in Namibia. As you can see, there's nothing else growing around there. Um, and the new research tries to understand why these leaves never wilt and uh, how they manage to survive the potentially high rates of water loss. And this is a study which has been conducted by uh, Gert Kruger and his colleagues from Northwest University. So this, if you have a look at this picture over here, this is a surface scanning uh, an electron micrograph. And these holes that you can see here are the pits that, uh, um, uh, in which the stomata reside. In other words, the, where, how, the, how the plant takes in CO2 and releases oxygen. And then you get these curious ridges here bet uh, between these rows of uh, stomata. Here is a sunken pit, and you can see the stoma inside there. Um, these are the guard cells which open and close the mouth of the stoma to either take in or release gases. Here is an electron micrograph cross-section of a stoma with its guard cells which open and close it, and the palisade cells underneath which are responsible for photosynthesis. But if you have a look again and on the top surface, you'll see these rows of stomata and these are these interesting ridges. And you, if you look inside the epidermis, what you can see are these ridges. And these are hypodermal cells. They are hypodermal fibers. This is a cross section from a micrograph and these pink columns that you can see here are the hypodermal fibers. And there is a cross section of a stomata. So what happens is in a normal plant, for example, a tomato leaf is that CO2 would enter here. It would then be converted into sugars by these black dots, which are the chloroplasts in these palisade cells. And, uh, and, so, and, and photosynthesis would then take place. However, when these palisade cells lose turbid pressure because of the lack of water, they collapse like balloons and they block all of the airways and they block any gas movement and they kill the whole photosynthetic process because everything collapses and the leaf wilts. And if it does not uh, get water via its root system, it will die in, in the long run. But this doesn't happen in the Velvetia. It never wilts. And the reason for this are these hypodermal fibers here, these columns, if you want, which keep this leaf very rigid. And even if these cells become very dehydrated, it doesn't matter. The whole system uh, is open to air and 
the plant will be able to photosynthesize as soon as there is moisture in the air again, for example, such as fog. So it sits there, this plant, waiting the whole time for this moisture to arrive without wilting. Wonderful adaptation. The other interesting uh, uh, new development is Stefan Vogel, who has worked in South Africa for many, many years. He recently passed away. And he's always been very interested in what he calls the curly whirly plants of the macroland. Why do so many of these plants have these curly whirly leaf structures? And he tells the story of when he was walking in the Alps and uh, it was cold and he had a woolen pullover on. And he noticed that uh, only on the very ends of the, of the woolen fibers, uh, and it was very foggy up in the mountain, that you would get a deposition of a water droplet right on the tip of the fiber. And this gave him the idea that sharp edges might uh, uh, facilitate the deposition of water if fog uh, is in the air. And you can look at, see these various structures here, of these various plants, including this one. And you can see in this one, you can actually see very fine fibers, very similar to the fibers on a jersey. And the idea is that the water would then collect on the edges of these sharp fibers, run down these leaves and down and to, the, to the bulb, which is underneath. These are all bulbous plants, which have this curly whirly structure. Very, very neat idea. It, it needs to be tested there. Chapter three is about heat. And uh, again, it's like water, it's about heat entering the animal and heat leaving the animal. And in, in this chapter, I deal with plants and temperature and of course animals, ectotherms, those rely on, that rely on external heat to reach an optimal body temperature and endotherms such as mammals, which produce their own heat. Um, I want to give you an example of some really excellent research. This is a 10 year study so far, maybe even 11, 12 years now, by Carsten Schroeden uh, at Hookup National Park in Springbok. He has studied this mouse, uh, the, uh, this is Rhabdomus. He has studied this mouse for 10 years. And it's a marvelous uh, group uh, a collection of research showing how one small mammal can survive. A, this is a diurnal mammal. It occurs during the daytime only, uh, it's active during the daytime. So this study shows how a tiny mammal can survive in a hot desert during the daytime when most rodents are nocturnal to avoid the heat and to avoid problems of water. And what you saw in this video is that this mouse was basking. It has black skin. They get up in the morning and instead of using their own energy to heat themselves up from their rest time body temperature, we're talking about having to heat the body about, about four degrees Celsius, they use the heat of the sun, incident radiation, and that this is facilitated by the black skin because the animal then acts as almost a perfect black body. And the energy savings that this animal accrues this way is what allows it to survive in this very uh, unproductive environment. The other major uh, development over the last couple of years has been the introduction of the Hot Birds Research Project which is led by Professor Andrew McKechnie, who is my former PhD student, and Dr. Susan Cunningham from UCT, Andrews from the University of Victoria. And what this project aims to do is to understand how birds, particularly in the Kalahari Desert, are going to cope with climate change. They've done a number of studies on a number of different birds. Here's a white-browed sparrow weaver that's been studied. There's been intensive research done on these pied babblers. They, these pied babblers have been habituated. Here is a, a volunteer researcher uh, weighing these pied babblers. You can see them hopping around her and uh, they have been trained to hop onto a scale 
for a small treat of boiled egg. And uh, in this way, every single day they are weighed. So their condition can be monitored relative to the environmental conditions such as temperature and so on. This is just one of the studies. The other one intensive study is on the yellable hornbill. And uh, here you can see uh, one of uh, Professor McKechnie's PhD students in that box there, he, there is a, uh, a nestling of the yellable hornbill. And you can see all these wires and contractions here. And what they're doing is measuring the body temperature of the nestling as well as the body temperature of the adult every time it arrives to uh, give food to the nestling. They've got cameras there, they've got everything there. And um, you see this yellow bulled horn bulled here with a mealworm in its mouth. They're doing a study on supplementing the food to see how that affects uh, their reproduction. And the general take home message from these studies is that the hotter it gets, the less time these birds have to forage because they need to sit in the shade and pant. And so that reduction in foraging time is severely hampering their condition and their ability to breed. And it's highly likely that many of these species will be locally extinct in the Kalahari within in the next several decades with continued climate change or certainly with global heating. Uh, here you can see a, a, one of Andrew's students uh, checking a, a nest box. If you have a look at the bottom of the picture, you see water. He had to swim to the tree because this is the Kuruman River in full flood. And if you notice his boots and his, and his clothing, he's sopping wet. He had to swim to get there. And on the right-hand side, you can see similar studies being done on meerkats. There the meerkats are being weighed in the same way that the babblers were being weighed. Chapter four is about the struggle for food. Obviously, in an unproductive environment such as deserts, food is a real problem. Uh, so this chapter deals with competition in plants for, for nutrients and water, competition in animals, and how animals handle very poor quality food. Uh, ju just to say that not much has happened uh, in this chapter. There are not many new developments, so I'm not going to talk, give you any examples about uh, any new research in the struggle for food. Oh, this is one example. So part of the, uh, this chapter deals with the understanding of these iconic uh, circles, uh, which you find in Namibia, they're called fairy circles. Uh, and uh, this is a picture from my drone. You can see my car down there. Uh, this is taken in the pro armor. And what causes these things? This has been a long debate. And uh, there have been many, many ideas, although the prevailing idea is that they are certainly, that they were probably caused by termites. But recent research has started to challenge these ideas again and suggest that these might have been sites for uh, where euphorbias used to grow, and when they died, their latex um, was leached into the soil. So here, for example, there's a study by Marion Mayer from the University of Pretoria. What you can see in this picture here in the front, this is a dead euphorbia dimerana, and you can see the formation of this dead uh, bare ring around it. And in the background, you can see several of these rings. And here you can see live Euphorbia dumbaranas. So this is throwing the kettle, uh, the cat amongst the pigeons again, should I say. And there's been a lot of responses to this uh, research and uh, the, the jury is still out. These are the same sorts of things which you find south of the Orange River. They call yellow keys and they're definitely caused by termites. A microhodotome is Viator, and I find it strange that such unusual landscape phenomena such as these circles should be separated by a political boundary, and yet no one can come up with a single common origin for them. Well, I think that there, there really needs to be a common origin, and I, have, I, and I suspect that a lot of the misunderstanding has to do 
with the non-appreciation of the fact that the winter rainfall region expands and contracts with the ice ages, which affects plant growth in the northern part of the, uh, of the winter rainfall region. As I'll explain to you later, is what's going on, uh, as uh, what is happening in currently in, uh, in the Richter's films. Chapter five is about the armory of de uh, desert conflicts. Nothing much has changed there. Chapter six is about social contracts. It's about this remarkable incidence of sociality amongst uh, animals in desert regions. This is something quite close to my heart. Uh, sociality evolving these animals to assist in finding food, to assist in vigilance against predators, and those are the various uh, mammals which are involved. And of course, just simply assisting in taming the climate, such as you see in sociable weavers. Here are the uh, meerkats, which have been studied intensively. And we have a, a great understanding of how the sociality in these animals has evolved in response to predator threats. In other words, their ability to use vigilance ensures their survival in the Kalari Desert. There is an enormous amount of research now taking place in, on the Demora mole rat. This is a eusocial animal, and this means that there's only one breeder. There's a queen and the rest are workers, just like the insect communities. And of course, we've, we've, we've tried to understand why it is that an individual would forego its own uh, opportunity to breed uh, and instead join a group where it might never have an opportunity to breed. So this is a great dilemma. How do you solve this problem in evolutionary terms? Well, of course, Hamilton came up with the explanation, uh, one explanation, which had to do with the relatedness of the animals between each other. So, for example, in social insects, the workers are related to each other by 75%. And so it doesn't matter who breeds. Individuals get... Uh, a hyper, higher percentage of their genes passed on even if one animal breeds in the colony. And the same thing applies in some respects to the eusocial mole rat, uh, the naked mole rat. And, uh, and these uh, uh, the Damara mole rats um, are not as closely related as the naked mole rat, but the explanation beyond Hamilton's rule was provided by George Price. And it had to do with the extra variance around the equation. And what he, what he showed very convincingly in his fantastic book, well, he, he didn't write the book, he was dead, um, called uh, The Price of Altruism, is that it doesn't matter how closely related you might be to a group. As long as there's a threat, and that threat might be from predators or from the climate, if you cooperate together to breed, then you are passing on a higher proportion of your genes than if you did not cooperate. So this is fantastic new research. Here is the sociable weaver that uses these uh, enormous nests to tame the climate. Chapter seven is about time out. It's about how plants and animals take time out from uh, the harsh desert conditions when there's no rain and when productivity is very low. So it involves uh, topics such as the daily activity patterns of, of animals. Um, these are called circadian rhythms in metabolism. Hibernation, some quite a few desert mammals hibernate during, uh, during the poor season. Ephemeral pond animals, these are animals that live in temporary ponds when it does rain. And then, of course, the topic of, of migration. So this photograph you can see uh, is taken in the macroland, showing you the annuals and, uh, and termite mouths. This is the rock elephant shrew, uh, Elephantulus myers. And uh, a lot of new research has shown that this animal uses what a form of daily hibernation called daily torpor when in, in winter in order to conserve considerable amounts of energy. And I was very happy that a very recent study and a PhD, in fact, from the University of Cape Town on trying to understand the ancient migration patterns of springbok, the so-called trekbokken, 
uh, came up with an explanation in the end, which was no different from that which I proposed in my first uh, edition. And so I did not even need to update this map. And you can see these green arrows here show you how these springbok used to move from the summer rainfall region of the Namakuru to the winter rainfall region when there was a severe drought in the Namakuru. And these droughts were linked to El Nino. The El Nino events could be neatly tacked on to each one of the major migration events that were recorded in history. And of course, in the winter rainfall has a very reliable rainfall compared to the Namakuru. And so these animals with a short hop and a skip can just simply cross over into a region where there is reliable winter vegetation. Chapter eight is about uh, uh, reproduction, uh, about desert annuals, how they produce seed and how these seeds lie dormant. It, it, it deals with the succulent cap seed capsule. This is one of the secrets to the success of the uh, Azoaceae in the uh, succulent guru. And then I, what I have done is I have uh, expanded quite considerably our new understanding of some of the pollination systems, particularly in the macroland. So here is, is a proposed example of Batesian mimicry by Anton Poe and his colleagues from the University of Stellenbosch. The idea here is that the orchid uh, Dyser Kiruika, which is this plant here with the long tube, is possibly mimicking Pelagonium over here the flower heads look similar and the nectar in the pelagonium sits down here. So it can only, pelagonium can only be pollinated by long tongue flies, such as this one here, because the nectar is right at the bottom. But of course, orchids cheat. They don't offer any rewards of nectar, of nectar like, uh, like the uh, pelagoniums do. So they cheat by uh, having a plant that looks very similar to the pelagonium. The, uh, the fly comes along, sticks its proboscis in there and picks up the pollinarium, as you can see, stuck to the bottom of this fly. Here you can see a pollinarium and thus the, they can then carry it to another one of these orchids and you can get cross-pollination. What a lovely example of Batesian mimicry. Here's another example of uh, how orchids cheat. This is the orchid ceturium. Uh, it doesn't offer any nectar as a reward, but it does produce a very strong smell of dead animals. And here you can see a fly emerging with it. Actually, this particular fly entered the plant with five of these pollinaria stuck to its thorax and came out with a sixth one. And also evidence that it had actually pollinated the stigma in this particular plant. Here's another example of a long tongue fly. You can see its proboscis tucked behind it. It almost looks embarrassed by the fact that it has two, uh, it has two orchid uh, pollinariums stuck to its face. And also a new example on how small mammals pollinate ground plants, such as white hedia bifolia. This is the macro rock mouse, Nicholas namaquensis and high elephant shrews as well pollinate parasitic plants. So these, this is all new data on pollination and I've expanded that section quite considerably. Here's another lovely example of sexual mimicry. The first example outside of the orchids. This is a Gortaria and you can see that these petals over here have these two shiny dots. Here you can see these two shiny dots and so too does this bee fly. So when this beef, when, when uh, the males of these bee flies see these dots, they think it's the female, they land on it to try to mate with her, and in so doing, get pollen all over them and pollinate the plant. How cool is that? Now, chapter nine is my new chapter, the ancient Kuru. I feel very strongly about the fact that uh, South Africans in particular are remarkably ignorant of the enormous wealth of information and fossils from the fossil record that we have from what happened 250 million years ago in the Karoo Basin. Now here is the Karoo Basin and 
We're interested in particularly in, in this, uh, this is called the Karoo Supergroup. And it's this Beaufort group in yellow, which has produced most of the interesting fossils. And the Stormberg group is younger. So the older ones are red, orange is the next oldest, yellow is the next oldest. And then the, the green, the Stormberg group, the youngest uh, layer in the, in the Karoo Basin. Now, what happened was that 500 million years ago, the Falklands Plateau separated from Africa, Falklands Plateau, but then about 330 million years ago, it started to approach the southern tip of Africa and caused enormous compression, which ultimately threw up the Cape Fold Mountains and trapped the uh, formed the Karoo Basin on the interior. This water had nowhere to go. So this became a sea for uh, an interior sea for a very long period of time. And it is on the borders and on the banks and on the shores of this Karoo Sea where most of these therapsids evolved. These are the early mammals. These are your ancestors that evolved right here. And the Karoo Basin tells the story of the evolution of the mammals better than anywhere else on Earth in a long, continuous record of nearly 100 million years. Now, there was a great extinction at the border between the Permian and the Triassic about 250 million years ago. Something between 80 and 90 percent of all terrestrial life and sea life went extinct. But the survivors are interesting. This shows you a family tree of some of the mammal survivors going right up to uh, Oligophysis, for example, which was an animal which is almost, well, a Morganocodon, which was a mammalia form. It was the very last stage in four true mammals. It just nearly lacked a little bone in its ear, otherwise it would have been a true mammal. And what you can see in this family tree and this gradation of colors is here, is how you get an in increase in the degree of endothermy, which is the ability to produce heat from within. So this massive permatriassic extinction event, this extinction event caused by uh, gases from the Siberian traps and so on, is ultimately responsible for producing some of the great features of mammalness, in other words, warm blood. And so too in the avian lineage, which uh, was evolving at the same time. Here is the synapsid village. Here are the Permian uh, mammals. This is what they looked like. They went extinct at the Perma-Triassic boundary. These are some of the survivors, particularly Lystrosaurus uh, was a great survivor. Um, this animal here survived, but showed a massive size reduction. And Kanamea, I went on almost to the middle of the Triassic before it went extinct. And then these animals led up to, for example, Morgan uh, uh, Megazastron, which is an animal which was almost a mammal, and right up to the late Triassic and the very early Jurassic. And the Karoo also records the remarkable evolution of the Sauropsid lineage. This is the lineage leading to the birds, the dinosaurs. And here are the early Triassic uh, Erythrosuchus, for example, that uh, started to radiate in the Triassic once the big mammals had gone extinct. Those big Permian herbivores and carnivores, once they went extinct, the reptile lineage said, thank you very much, we'll take over. And these are the sorts of uh, what are called archosauri forms, which evolved and started to compete with the, uh, those mammals that did survive the extinction. Here's a lovely one um, from the early Triassic. It's named after Nelson Mandiba. And Euparkaria is going to be on the 25 rand coin in South Africa really, really soon, which I'm very pleased about. And this animal is remarkable for the fact that it is one of the first reptiles to show an elongation of the back legs. In other words, the ability to run on the back legs. And ultimately, of course, this led to all bipedal theropsids, uh, uh, pteropods, sorry, which uh, led to the bird lineage, which, as you know, all have two legs. Here's an early crocodile form. And uh, here's an uh, early Jurassic. Here's Heterodontosaurus, notable for the fact that it's got differentiated teeth. And then, of course, a recent find in Lesotho of this enormous protosauropod. 
The whole record is there. Chapter 9 tells its story. Now, the last chapter is about the future of the deserts. And what I want to focus on here is not so much the conservation of the biome threats, but climate change. It's my hope that I can try and explain to you the mechanism that is happening uh, at the moment, which is causing climate change problems, particularly in the succulent Karoo. And in order to understand what's going on, it's very important that you first understand these major circulation patterns of the earth. There's the tropics, the intertrop intertropical convergence zone. Have a look at this cell here, it's called the Hadley cell. So warm air moves towards the equator. Here you can see it, it's tilted towards the west caused by the Coriolis forces of the, of, of, of the earth spinning around on its axis. And this warm, moist air flows towards the tropics and it meets an opposing a, a ground air coming from the northern hemisphere in the northern Hadley cell. And these, these columns of air bang into each other, they rise. This is now a low pressure zone, they cool adiabatically and produce rain, which is responsible for the rain of the tropics. But this air returns at high altitude, about 18 kilometers. It's cold, dry air, and it meets an opposing column of air, which is also cold and dry from the feral cell. And they descended about 30 degrees south and, of course, 30 degrees north. And where they bang into each other, they produce the subtropical jet stream. But this air descends initially as uh, cool air, but it heats as it approaches the uh, Earth's uh, surface. It heats by compression and it is still dry. And it is this area here, it is this descending high pressure ridge, which is primarily primarily responsible for all of the deserts in the Southern Hemisphere and in the Northern Hemisphere. You can see here how this coincides, for example, with the Sahara. Now, if you, I mean, let's just go back here. These are the westerlies here. So these are easterlies and the easterly trade winds and then south of 30 degrees are the westerlies. And the westerlies are the wind systems which bring cold fronts to the Cape. Here you can see a beautiful cold front from in July uh, 2020. And when this cold front sweeps across here, it brings rain to the southwestern parts of Southern Africa. Winter, reliable, consistent winter rain. Now the problem is this, that high pressure zone here, over here, keeps these westerlies in place. If this line had to shift down where these meet, then you're going to shift the wind westerlies up or down. And this is exactly what's happening because here's the Hadley cell, there's the equator. And what's happening is that where this air descends, it is now expanding to the south. And this is pushing the westerlies further south. And the consequence of that is that it is pushing the winter rainfall region to the south, because this high pressure zone is moving south and it's pushing these westerlies, which bring rain to the Western Cape to the south. And that is why we have these massive droughts now, particularly in the northern part of the winter rainfall region, but even down in Cape Town, so-called day zero, is a consequence of what's happening here. Now, those are the northwest cells. You also get east-west cells, and these are called walker cells. And under normal conditions, what would happen is that the easterlies would blow the warm water across the Pacific, for example, it would rise, and this would bring monsoon rain to India and so on, and then it would descend over the western parts of the continent, and this would produce deserts, um, not only here, but in Africa as well. And then the problem is that when you have conditions of El Nino and La Nina, these cells start to break up into smaller cells and you can have uh, not only unpredictable uh, conditions, but you can have disastrous consequences of this. For example, let's take what happens here during a El Nino. Here we saw that you had the monsoon rains produced by this, this persistent low pressure. This is what happens during El Nino. Now you get a persistent high pressure. 
And this causes a drought and real problems, not only in India, but in Africa as well. So if you have a look at the map, rainfall map of Southern Africa, these lines that you can see here are the variability of rainfall across the continent. And this east-west variability that you can see, so it's most variable here along the west coast, and it's more reliable on the east coast. And this variability here is caused by primarily by the long-term effects and the combination of El Nino, La Nina, and the Southern Hadley Cells High Pressure Ridge. Now, what happens during a La Nina is that these easterlies increase in strength. And one of the consequences of this during La Nina is it, it can bring in cyclonic um, patterns of weather from the Indian Ocean. And a classic example is what happened earlier this year in 2021, when Cyclo, Cyclone Eloise barreled across the country. It was then tracked by the high pressure zone here and here. Here you can see a westerly front coming in. The high pressure zone is sort of sitting like that. It barreled across, it got tracked there, had nowhere to go. This is called a cutoff flow. And these regions of the Kalahari and of uh, eastern Namibia receive almost double their annual rainfall from this one single event. So this gives you an example of how La Nina can add great variability to the rainfall patterns. And in general, you can summarize it in this way here. You can have uh, El Nino causes dry conditions uh, and warm conditions in uh, Southern Africa, and La Nina brings wet and cool conditions. Now, the other factor, apart from these east-west and north-south air circulation systems, is the average temperature of the Earth and how it has changed over the last five million years in, in what we, we now know as the ice ages. So if you have a look at this graph here, this is part of five million years, you can see how the average temperature of the Earth has decreased. But more importantly, look how the temperature has started to fluctuate here in the last two million years. These are the ice ages. And so if you blow up this last million years, this is the last million years, you can see that you have these cold spells about every 100,000 years, and then they're interrupted by what's called the interglacial. So this is a glacial, that's an interglacial. And this is, these are reliable ice ages. You can have plants that evolve under these conditions, and they are used to these fluctuations, these long-term fluctuations in temperature. But what's happening at the moment is we are stuck in an interglacial. And it should have gone down long ago. It should have gone down before the Industrial Revolution, and it hasn't. And in fact, the predictions are is, is that it's going to stay at this temperature for the next 50 to 100,000 years. And that has nothing to do with human input. It's got nothing to do with humans adding uh, greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. It will stay at that naturally, but of course, humans will increase the temperature way above here. In fact, here's one degree above it, and you see we're already heading for two degrees uh, above this, and that is going to have vast consequences for organisms that evolve during this period that are not adapted to that very high temperature. So, for example, you look at a study on Conophyton by Andrew Young. He predicts that 80% uh, of these uh, button plants in the Macland will be extinct uh, within the next 50 years. Now, I want to end off with a little clip uh, from a video I've been making. I've extracted it to show you the sorts of concerns that uh, uh, we have. And this is a visitation to the Richtersfeld in the Macula. If I had to choose a plant as an example of one which is going to go extinct in the next couple of years as a consequence of climate change in the succulent Karoo, it has to be this very rare Allo, Allo Pearsonii. I'm here on top of Hills Kloof in the Richtersfeld. And this population that you can see around me here is completely dead except for this one little leaf. 
My prediction is that this plant will be extinct within the next 10 years if we have another drought, such as we've had prior to the rainfall this year. We had a seven year, nine year, seven to nine year drought in this region of uh, southwestern Africa. The reason that these aloes have died is because of the southward contraction of the winter rainfall region. This is driven by climate change. The contraction to the south is caused by the expansion of the southern Hadley cell, which is caused by the warming of Antarctica and the Southern Ocean, and that is all driven by global warming. What you're seeing here, if I break this leaf off here, I will probably drive this plant to extinction in the wild. It's my prediction that this plant is headed for extinction in the wild. Thank you very much. Sorry to end on such a gloomy note. Larry, thank you so much for a fascinating talk and um, a wonderful presentation, beautiful photos. I have enjoyed this thoroughly and I'm sure uh, we all have. And uh, yeah, let's, uh, I, I first want to mention, of course, this book, uh, The Living Deserts of Southern Africa is on sale. The new version is, uh, the latest version is in the Kirstenbosch bookshop. It's an online, we have an online shop and it is, uh, uh, there's a shop here at Kirstenbosch. So if you want to get a copy, the normal price is 450 rands, but there is a special at the moment of 15%, which brings the price to 382 rands 50. I'm definitely doing some Christmas shopping this afternoon. Uh, it makes a beautiful gift, I think. Uh, but let's open up the, the floor for some questions. Any questions for Barry? I see some thank you messages here. Barry, as you said, you, you ended on, a, on a, a, a gloomy note. And I think, you know, that raises the question to, to all of us who care about the environment over and over. What is it that we can, what is your perspective on this? What can we as individuals actually do to, uh, if anything, to stop um, or, or to, to at least contribute to this not happening, to plants not going extinct, to animals not going extinct, to, to stopping climate change in some way? Uh, should we become vegans? What is it that we can do, you know, when, when we once again get faced with uh, like in your presentation now with uh, the fact that climate change is affecting uh, the earth so badly, you, you get this overwhelming feeling of, wow, we, we have to do something. What is, what is your take on it? Well, look, you know, obviously we have to try and reduce anthropogenically induced heating. Um, it's a, I mean, it's a scary fact that we are stuck in this, uh, this interglacial, but if we don't add to the problem, such as we are doing, I mean, the warming of the Southern Ocean uh, is anthropogenically induced. Uh, it's this added heat that we're putting on top of it, which is pushing plants over the top. And of course, pushing climate patterns and changing climate patterns, such as the winter rainfall region. So quite clearly, we just we, we really have to reduce our, our carbon footprint dramatically. Otherwise, you know, life's just not going to be the same as it was. I'll be dead by then. But yeah, it's just yeah. listen to what people are saying about climate change and do what you can to stop it stop all the unnecessary heating that's going on, the unnecessary gases and burning of fossil fuels in particular. Yeah, yeah. I've got the questions here in front of me. Uh, Bruce Eitzen from LA, interested in your map of animal migrations between climate change data. What do you know about people movements like the Khoisan about 2000 years ago? Well, I don't know much personally about it, but I do know that uh, these, uh, the Nama that lived in this area 
um, certainly were highly migratory and uh, they never ever settled down into one area. They had migratory camps all over the place, which stretched from the Namakru right across into the Sakhigan Kuru. So that I'm absolutely sure they would have migrated to wherever there was good grazing for their sheep, fat-tailed sheep. Uh, Marion Mayer, ah, Marion Mayer has, uh, was the, uh, the guy I mentioned who had done the study on berry rings and uh, the role of euphorbia. He asks, we have seen big numbers of euphorbia dying in the sandy areas of northern prone on areas. Are you aware of that? Well, Marion, I, I don't know if you were blind, but I did show a photograph of it from your study. So uh, yes, I'm completely aware of it and I did talk about it. So that's the only questions I see so far. Right, thank you so much. Uh, I think if anybody else has, has questions uh, later, do send them to us at, at Kirstenbosch or even on our, our social media, and uh, we will uh, pose the questions to, to Barry afterwards and, and get back to you. Um, uh, but I do, I do see some more questions coming up here somewhere, but these are in the chats, I think. Ah, I think the, I see there's a question. The question yeah, that's. Section. That's right, there's a question in the chat, Barry. It says, is there anything done to protect the aloe that you expect to be extinct in the wild soon? I think that is the one that you, you showed in the video. Yes, um, well, you know, I have uh, spent quite some time talking to um, one of South Africa's most remarkable botanists. His name is Peter Van Beek, and he is the botanist in the Richtersveld uh, Trans Frontier Park. I don't think there's another man on this planet who knows more about the plants and the succulents of the Richtersveld than he does. And he's managed to germinate the seeds of, of this aloe and he's measured their growth rates. Their growth rates are, are less than a, a, a centimeter a year. So he estimates that those plants out there are probably hundreds of years old and that these are the slowest growing aloes in the world. So it's going to be a momentous task to try and keep this genome um, alive in, in cultivation, because this is obviously a very difficult plant to grow and it grows so extremely slowly. But I've got no doubt that uh, some efforts are going to be made to, to possibly improve the uh, the germination of these seeds and the technology of, of storing the seed bank. Um, it's a scary reality and, uh, it, you know, this is a very rare aloe and a very unique aloe and, uh, yeah, I guess it's, 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 a, it's symptomatic of what's going on not in, in, in the Richtersfeld. And this is not the only plant that's sort of going extinct. There are plants that, are, that Peter van der Weyck has seen go extinct. Some of those were driven to extinction by poachers, and some have gone extinct naturally. He says it's a very depressing thing when you go and you've been monitoring a population of conophytum for 10 years, and you're monitoring their growth and so on, and then you go there and uh, high up in the mountain and the entire population is gone, and uh, mostly stolen by poachers. Um, wow. Okay, I've got. I see here, uh, Barry. We... I've got one, a question here for Marjorie Robenheimer. The so called fairy rings caused by termites, are they totally underground or do they make mounds? They look flat in the photo. Well, actually, Marjorie, they're not flat. They're actually uh, concave. In other words, they, they, they dipped, they're, they're sort of basin shaped. And, and this is caused by wind action. Um, and simply because there's no vegetation growing on them, it allows the wind to blow out the sand uh, within them. There seems to be absolutely no uh, major activity on the surface of the uh, caused by the termites, but certainly the termites are there. If you dig down, you will find them. But I think that what I was trying to say is that you must try and imagine what that area might have looked like, let's say, 
50,000 years ago during the glacial period when you had winter rainfall stretching up that coast, it would have been vegetated. And what would have it have been vegetated with? Which plants grew there? Were they euphorbias as well, such as we see in the northern parts? Uh, in fact, euphorbia damarana growing throughout Namibia? Or was it a smaller euphorbias? Or was it other plants? But sort of other plants, but certainly the 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 Mayer, the Mayer study has shown the, the presence of the latex is there and it affects the properties of the sand in terms of its ability to hold water. Water just goes straight through that sand. Um, so, you know, I think people need to stop sort of seeing this fairy circle condition as a, as a non-dynamic situation. I think what you're seeing is things that have, might have happened in the past and you need to factor in the ice ages and its effect on vegetation patterns and, and climate patterns. Okay, that's all I can see in the questions and answers. Yes, I, I think so, Barry. Um, people have also asked, will the presentation be available? And yes, it will be available on the Kirstenbosch uh, and the Stroke Nature. Uh, Facebook pages and it's also going on to the Penguin Random House is a YouTube channel so it will be available for anybody who would like to see it again or pass on to friends and so on please uh, yeah watch uh, those those platforms for the presentation Barry thank you so much once again this was really fascinating and uh, very interesting and very uh, uh, sobering talk as well about what is happening uh, in the deserts and, and what climate change is doing uh, to, to these beautiful environments. Thank you once again, and thank you to everybody who has attended this talk today. And uh, yeah, yeah. until next time, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. And, uh, you know, just all I can say is hey, just get away from COVID, get in your four by four and head out to those remarkable deserts and enjoy them as they are, while they still are as they are. Enjoy your trip. Thanks. Thank you, Barry. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.